Hello and welcome back to the Science of Psychotherapy. I'm Matthew Darlitz, Editor-in-Chief of the Science of Psychotherapy magazine, uh, and I'm here with Richard Hill, who is Managing Editor. But today, we're not going to do magazine. <laughs> we're, we're continuing on our, on our uh, little exploration of what it is to be working as a therapist. Richard? Yes, I'm loving this series, Matt. Uh, I'm learning a lot. And so uh, today, we're going to talk to uh, Andrew Zimmerman, who is an accountant. He goes into actually more than just accounting. He goes into practices about money, practices about um, the, the, the idea of developing and making money. And I think what he's, what he's getting us towards is, is really more towards the, the coaching of how to manage money uh, as different yeah. from just talking about uh, your specific accounting needs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so very important topic today. Uh, if you're, you know, you're going into business for yourself, then accounting, the, the money side, you know, you, is you're going to live or die depending on what, what's happened, happens with the money side of things. And so what Andrew is going to cover um, about uh, working in another business first to get some practical experience. Um, he, he talks about getting a coach and a mentor because that's what he does. Uh, he talks a lot about cash flow um, and cash flow is uh, extremely important. So we're going to learn a little bit about that. Uh, he talks about signposts of change. So you know uh, what to look for when you need to uh, step up uh, or step down something in your business. Uh, knowing costs, knowing value, knowing the value of your service, knowing what you're worth and how to communicate that, very important. Uh, being clear about what you're offering. So he talks about what's on the menu and if it's on the menu, you better be able to deliver it. Um, we talk again about advertising spend. I know we covered that last time also uh, with Paul Jackson. And um, and then finally, uh, as a mentor, you know, he gives some some words of wisdom there. So Let's dive in and uh, we'll catch you on the other side. You know, I just want to encourage anyone and everyone about being in small business or, or in business of some kind. Um, it just creates so much more opportunities in life than than just working nine till five for somebody else, though there are benefits to that that also um, need to be considered, but if if you're inspired and aspiring to be in business, and you're straight out of university, I think there's probably um, two or three things that are really important. Number one, I would lean into the dream. Uh, there's a there's a myth, and I I know that Michael Gerber wrote a book called The E Myth. If if that's just a, a recommended read about this, I you know people get this idea of being in business. Um, it's one thing to get the idea, but it's another to, to actually get it off the ground. So number one, lean into the dream and, and get your why. Um, number two, find someone else in business that's established and find a way of working alongside of them or in their ecosystem. Because we learn a lot more by, by catching or as they say, caught rather than taught. And there's just so many Business is a juggling act, and to learn the skill of juggling, you don't learn that at uni. So getting around an established business, I would say would be a highly recommended, even if it means delaying the start of your business two, three, five years, it's really about preparation for your future, for your future business. And you know, number three, I think, is to, to read and research, um, learn from other people's stories um, on, on what works and what doesn't, and that's a, uh, I'd probably recommend. You know, as professionals, um, psychologists consider their professional years and, and whether they do masters or go on to do doctorates and things like that. Um, you know, to be a master of ever, anything, you know, there's a certain level of rigor and testing. Um, same with being in business. It, it, is, it, is, it is relentless, it is unforgiving, being in business is not an easy road and I think having that sense of a coach in your corner or, or, or if you've got an, a, a, you know, an aspiration to run marathons, well you need to start with 400 meter races and 800 meter races and really get that testing out, what is this like? I think that's really important before you start borrowing large amounts of money, putting you know, your family, um, if you are married, into a situation of of risk 
because you're really going into business. These are often recipes for failure and often stack up in the 80% failure rate in the first three years of business, which is the going statistic. So how do we avoid the 80% failure rate is kind of what I'm alluding to. Um, you know, lean into the dream, really work out what is your why, because your why will keep you when you want to quit. And learning by being with others, um, whether it's within a business, which would be the most ideal, go and work for someone. I did it for eight years. I, I worked for somebody else in an accounting practice before I started my own. It has just been so vital to, to, to our journey, but it would be the same in any other Delay the start of your business in order to get your roots and your foundations right. That would be my bottom line. Yeah. Really, uh, one of the key elements to the business, and we talk about a multifaceted elements of your business that you're juggling, or would, what would we say, you know, you're, you're having to be across and you're at, um, those, those 10 critical areas in your business that you need to be looking after. One of those really big areas is your finances and managing cash flow. So, so starting out, obviously having the lower costs that you can. Um, for example, do I go and hire a professional suite or do I look at renting a house that has a separate room that I can really utilize that as a professional space to earn um, and to, to, to function in, in my professional practice? You know. The risks involved in going and getting a lease, a commercial lease, and taking on that overhead is much higher when you're starting out. Um, whereas to reduce that risk would be to consider a lower cost um, room that you could work from. So it's, it's kind of like though that kind of, um, at, at the beginning stages, keeping your costs um, as low as you can in order to create profit that you can draw out as a sole practitioner to pay the bills, to get bread on the table. My personal journey was, um, as I said before, eight and a half years in another accounting practice and I served um, right through the ranks and did my apprenticeship and did the long hours and as they say, you know, poured out my blood, gave my pound of flesh. But when it was time for me to launch out of the plane into my small, my small business, micro small business, um, I had five clients to start with and, and four of those were my family. So, you know, I started from scratch, uh, absolute scratch. Uh, and it was with a laptop in my living room and uh, working, working from that space. And it was, was two years before we were able to move into um, a space that was bigger than my living room and go for two rooms. And um, so from my personal experience, when you're starting out, you're very much enthusiastic and you're happy to take anyone with anything with a heartbeat, you're happy to take on because you, you need the work and you need to build your customer base. Um, but for me starting out, I look back and I shudder, but we made it, you know, we came through that vulnerable, tricky phase, but just the key was keeping the overheads down, the fixed costs down, um, you don't have to, I didn't have to hire staff for, for a little while. So you can, you can manage things when they're small. Uh, it's a good way to start. When you're in business, you need to know the signposts and the markers of change. Uh, sometimes we can have what we would call a spike in income, but it's not sustainable. You know, a spike in income, a little bit more cash in the bank, um, it gives us options doesn't necessarily mean I should commit to um, a, a higher overhead, a, a monthly fixed cost, because that spike is just temporary. As a sole practitioner, I had that many hats on, and that's what you've got to do when you're starting out. It's looking and planning for which hat am I gonna take off first? And I knew what that was. I knew I needed another junior accountant or another accountant to begin to take the workload off me because I had that many client inquiries and my capacity was full and I wasn't doing other things well, like invoicing, which is pretty important. So yeah, I think for me and for each of the, the, the listeners, you need to have markers and a way of measuring those markers, knowing that 
we've had a change in the water level of the business. It's, it's no longer an, you know, the tide comes in and out and comes in and out. But when the water level rises to a new level, that's the point where you say, yeah, I'm assessing. That's, this is sustainable. We've, we've gone from that monthly income to that monthly income. And probably for us was the, just having that estimated profit and loss for 12 months, looking at a trajectory of growth that I would like and hitting those markers along the way and going, ah, you know, September, September we, we were aiming for 10 and we did a 12 and a 14 and the next month we got an 11 and then we got a, a 16. There was a new level from that baseline of 10. So you can tell, okay, cool. I think I'm at that perspective or that place to leverage an, a, a, an employee. So from the beginning, just re reiterating the fact that when you're starting out and when you're beginning, it's just so important to keep a real tight check on your fixed costs. There's always setup costs, which you can't avoid, but we can be creative around those um, as well. But you know, there's some basic things you need like a website um, and things like that. And um, they're the things you're gonna need to kick off your business. So knowing what your capital startup costs are and then what are your monthly fixed costs. And your wage is very much a part of that fixed cost. Uh, so, you know, there is a going statistic that in the first three years of business, 80%, there's an 80% failure rate to starting small business. Uh, I think you could probably, to really look at and drill down around the statistics of that, you know, what's making up the 80%, what's the, the reason, the driving reason. Um, there are a number of factors. One is you shouldn't have gone into business anyway, a premature idea that, oh, wow, I can earn more money than working for somebody else is, a, is almost a, a hallmark. This isn't going to work well. You've got to have a whole lot more going on than just the idea that I'm going to make more money. The other real reason, which we can talk about now, is cash flow. Um, cash flow is like oxygen and you need to have it in order to survive. And so, you know, you can start out with a bundle of, of, of clientele, you know, get your website, open up your books, have bookings and uh, start to have customers come through the door and charging and paying. There's a, there's a, number, of, there's a number of things that will, will help you and, and maybe we can just touch on, on a few of those ideas a profit and loss we understand as income, less expenditure to give us what we would call a, a gross profit. Um, a gross profit is, is a good uh, metric to measure. And I would say having things like a, an accounting system is just really imperative to start out with one. So that, that's just important to having a cash flow mindset is have an accounting system that helps you measure my ins and my outs. What I'm looking with cash flow is what's left over. And if we call that fat or cream, uh, at the beginning parts of the year, there's no fat or cream. We probably have a negative. We have to fund that negative somehow. And that's usually savings or family members or the fact that you're working after hours or calling in favors with friends. Uh, the the other thing apart from having an accounting system is to begin to analyze this. This is probably what, what most businesses fail to understand. Out of gross profit, I need to pay liabilities. Example, tax. And this is, this is, the, this is the Achilles heel. This, this, if I, I see this so many times, Matthew. If you've, if you've let's, let's say that you've, you've had 100 for the month, 100 units um, of whatever is income. So you've, you've earned 100 and you've had 80 as expenses. We're left with what, 20, right? 100 less 80 equals 20. And people go, yay, 20. I'm, I'm what's left over, so I get the full 20. Yes, you do uh, in a sense, but what you have to factor in is at least 25 to 30% of the 20 is a provision for tax. And this is what gets caught out. A month goes past. I haven't put aside 
a small portion of the, of the 20. I don't know how much to put aside. I don't put it aside and it's 18 months before I'm sitting in front of an accountant to say, oh, and by the way, you have a $16,000 tax bill. Um, that could have easily been solved by putting aside, say, a 25% of the 20%. But it's important, number one, to know, have we made profit in the month? And if we have, make a provision. And that could look like a savings, putting a certain amount aside. There's lots of different ways to approach that. But the key principle with cash flow is provisioning for future liabilities. That's not on your P&L. Having to pay your, the ATO is not a profit and loss item, and that's why it gets lost. It's a, an accrual of an owing, a liability. It's accruing while we're doing business. I owe this to someone in the future, but I'm not putting it aside out of the profits in order to pay that future liability. Right there is the quintessential principle of why businesses fail, because time and money accumulate, and uh, it's a surprise. Ah, oh, there you go, there's a surprise. But it was, it was there every day if you had a keen eye and put in a, a strategy in place to provision. Let's just talk about valuing and value pricing. Um, being practitioners, being in the psychology space, uh, being in counseling or, or, or um, the types of professionals that we're talking to today, really an hourly rate is the industry norm. So it's a starting point. We have to start at an hourly rate. And I think what's just super important is to have a, a runway, stepping stones over a three year period. Have a look at what's happening in the industry. Have a look what first level, first year, second year, provisional account, uh, provisional psychologists and registered and all that. There's, there's, there's knowledge there to sort of show you what's expected from an industry level. That's your starting point. But, but really what you're wanting to do is have a runway so that you might start off on the lower end of the industry, shooting towards the middle with the goal of being at the higher end um, or even above the higher end on the basis that you want to bring value to your customers and to your clients. And so it's, it's really pricing needs to be connected to value. And that's an important, it's a whole topic to go through because it's very, it's very um, as I said before, it's very confronting looking at your, 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 your hourly rate and your value, but it's super important because it will be the linchpin that will determine your cash flow, which will determine how much money is left at the end of the month and whether you go on a holiday or not. Those sort of things come right down to, to your pricing. So have a pricing plan. And even if you're starting off at $100 an hour, um, consider the strategy of discounting, which is, is showing to the customer the value that you are at $200 an hour, or $180 an hour and say, look, we're doing a, a 30% discount for the next few months. And they can, on the invoicing, it's actually showing um, 180, less $50. Today's session is 130. There's a sense of give back, but there's also a sense of timing that the discount's not there forever or else you'll be, you'll be cornered into a, into a low price for a long-term client. And that, that, can, that can have a, um, a sting in the tail for you at the end. I think what you've got to do is know what's on your menu, know what, pro what, what is on your, your product menu list. It's really important you don't go into a cafe and you know, um, not have a menu put in front of you with pricing. Uh, it's really important for people to have options and to choose from. Uh, the other important thing is if it's on the menu, it needs to be in the kitchen. You know, we need to have the capacity and the ability to produce it and um, it's it's a really negative experience when you have something on the list and the, sh the chef says, no, sorry, it's not available today. We're out of stock. Or So it's just important that whatever is on our menu list, we have the capacity to do it exceptionally well. If not, we're better at sticking at what we're doing exceptionally well and building up a reputation over time uh, because that becomes what I talk about as your, your sustainable income flow. 
might not be the big uh, leverage um, game changing products, but you're better at having a slow and steady income flow. And that might be just your consultations. It might be, you know, just that you keep seeing you're in front of clients. Every person will have what I would say is their staple product. It's their, um, it keeps coming in. There's still a profit in, in, in all of that. And it also, most importantly, it generates more clientele. And so that, that's really important to establish our, our what I call our bedrock um, products. And then once the business is established, and usually that's usually that two to four year period, it's around a three year period for you to establish a new business, that's when you can start to add complementary services to your suite that help. Um, and, and again, you're always listening to clients and customers and you go, oh wow, there's something that no one else is doing. Uh, there's an opportunity. Do the product development and look into the profitability and sustainability. Could we, could we add that into our suite? That's what a true entrepreneur is doing, um, constantly adapting. So yeah, your, your, your product menu is, uh, is super important to value that, back to our initial discussion around valuing. Um, and don't put it on the list if you can't do it well. Looking at the topic of advertising and marketing and how much spend uh, to put into that, it's, a, it's a, a big topic and there's lots of different opinion and conjecture around it. The, the, normal, the normal narrative from the intellectuals and the business realm is that you should be measuring, measuring your marketing for every dollar of spend, what's the return? I find that really hard to to translate. Uh, example with your practitioners, like how do we how do we work with that? Um, there's no right or wrong here. I think it, but it is about testing, measuring, and adjusting. Uh, you could spend a lot of money on Facebook marketing, and there's there's probably a way for you to when a new client comes on to say, hey, how did you hear about us? And if you've got the ability to, to, to uh, confirm that that referral came through from Facebook, then you can put a, you know, we can do a value, we can test that. We can say, well, I spent $1,000 on Facebook marketing for the month of March, and I had $5,000 of, of new business come in. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a good return on investment, 1000 for 5000 What's the feedback? Well, that appears to be working. Uh, so I guess um, it depends on what your product is and what your clientele are, um, what your clientele are doing and what their age group is, um, how the social media is are, social media platforms tend to be now a very much how people are engaging with business now online. So I think it's all important. Your website, I think, is is worth the spend because it's your business card. So invest in your website, um, work on a marketing strategy with a dollar spend at the beginning. You probably will do a lot of your own, just do subtle, soft, telling people who you are and why you're there. It might not necessarily, it's more subtle. Um, if you're an Excel spreadsheet type of person and you've got the pizza cutter and you're cutting up the pie, then look, a five to 10% of your income is a good starting point for, for budgeting. Um, for repeat business, for example, um, you know, if your business um, is looking at repeat customers, then, then you need to measure not just the, 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 the monthly income, but the future income that that advertising spend has generated. That's a much, you know, you can get more value out of that. So if I get, uh, how long do customers stay with me? What's my repeat customer um, ratio? So yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things, think about a, a, a two to 10%, 5% is probably a good starting point and go, well, put some money aside for that. What sort of, what sort of um, return on investment could I get for that? What sort of advertising um, opportunities are out there. At the end of the day, probably 
the most important advertising or the most uh, successful marketing are your customers themselves because they will talk about you. And if they have a good experience, um, then they're going to talk, which we tied into not locking in as the cheapest. You want to create a, a, a reputation of being of, of a person or a business that has value. They answer the problem. They get to, they've solved the problem that I've had. I'm getting a lot of traction. And, and so that, oh, I'm looking for a new psychologist. Well, we want your name to be the one that, could. that is paramount the best type of advertising and marketing because it only required you to do your job well. And it's a slower approach to business, but it's a more sustainable approach. So I would, I would say that would be your starting point. Look at your referral process, make it easy for customers to, to talk about you. Be careful not to offer too many referral discounts and get into a web of, um, commissions and all that sort of thing at the beginning, it's just, it, it becomes something that is catching you out and it, it can work against you. Um, but be grateful and thankful if people refer to you, if there's another practitioner that re has referred you, pick up the phone, acknowledge that, um, take the time to, to appreciate where your referrals are coming from, look at strengthening that relationship, um, make sure you do something to, to give back a goodwill to those referral sources. Um, as well as your, your dollar spend, um, social media and, and conventional and unconventional marketing approaches. Probably the most important aspect of your business is you as the business owner. You know, we, we can talk about all the things you can do. You can have all those tools, you can have the skills, you can go and do seminars and all those sorts of things. And a lot of what we're talking about is available online. You know, what's a break even point? It, it's a mathematical equation and you can apply that to your business. What's harder to, to ascertain and, and, but more important is having a mentor, is having co a coach, is having what I call someone in your corner that is really there championing you as a person, as a professional. And, and I would really recommend the practitioners listening is, is look at having somebody in your corner, both personally, who, has, who, who understands the nature of your business, so someone in business, because they understand the, the demands. When, when you're an employee, you knock off at five, you probably give no more thought to your work after five o'clock, you think about your family and your home life, your goals, holidays. When you're in business, you're, you don't shut off. You don't stop thinking at five. You're there till midnight, working on a project, um, wrapping up a report, preparing for the next day, and oh yeah, that's right, I forgot to invoice for the last three days. Having the person in your corner that has the hand to put on your shoulder to say, hey, you're working too hard, Andrew. Matt, you, 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 you know, you've done seven weekends in a row. How sustainable is this? You need that tap on the shoulder because, because you're alone. This is a very lonely, uh, a lonely journey and you need to have that tap on the shoulder, that support to draw upon. So there's that personal element and then I think as a professional element, have people that you're connected to that are more senior than you, have 10 or 20 years experience on you. They've worked through exactly where you're at and they've got the gold to share with you. And I would really work towards having those people in your corner as well as your accountant, um, who should have an element of that from the financial side. Someone that, that's sitting there going, giving you back the feedback and to confirm you're doing things well or to, to actually say, hey, you really need to improve. And you're like, oh, wow, I, this is, so, yeah, I'm ashamed. I've overspent, you know, I've, I've uh, it's accountability. And um, I think having, I just kind of, I can't emphasize uh, too much the power of having the people in your corner and keeping them there and picking up the phone, sending the email, having regular check-ins face-to-face, not just over the phone, but 
catch-ups is your recipe for long-term success. So I wish you all the best uh, wherever, wherever you're at. And uh, yeah, thank you for, to, for today. It's been really good. Well, Richard, um, I've had some experience with Andrew uh, as my own personal mentor with uh, money. And um, I tell you, uh, it's been extremely valuable. So I would encourage if you are starting out, even if you have started out, you're in business, you know, you and you want to be doing this really well from the money side of things, get yourself um, somebody who can coach you and, uh, and lead you into good money practices yeah it's really important matt that we we have to remember that if we're in business for ourselves if we have our own uh clinic our own uh, practice or even a a, a a room within a practice that we are an entrepreneur we are yeah. a small business owner and although our focus our real focus of attention is on the mental health and well-being of our clients yeah. we need to provide them with the capacity to have this service and to maintain this service so this is just wonderful uh wonderful wonderful assistance to to be able to to still be here and you know i'm yeah. i'm so pleased myself now i think i'm just about 20 years in practice now and, and if you're still here after 20 years you must be doing a couple of things right and i still learn stuff from listening listening to this wonderful lecture today fantastic well thank you everybody for joining us uh, on this series of some practical tips on how to uh, be working as a therapist uh, but for now thanks for dropping in and uh, we'll see you next time bye for now <laughs>